G'day, this is Mel Mag Live. I'm Will. A decade ago this month, between 10 and 20,000 people came together in Melbourne to protest liquor licensing regulations which put enormous strain on live music venues. One venue, Collingwood's The Tote, had been forced to close its doors the month before, its demise a catalyst for the protest. The Tote has, of course, since reopened under new management and remains a key part of Melbourne's live music scene. Bruce Milne was, the, was a co-owner of the Tote when it uh, closed and is host of Triple R FM's Where Yo Is and is a co-owner of Greville Records. He joins us now via Facebook uh, Live to chat about the, or sorry, to reflect on the events of 2010 and evaluate how our music scene is faring in 2020. Bruce, how are you doing? Uh, uh, but apologies that your first experience is so glitchy today. Uh, Okay, so Bruce, um, we'll start a bit. For the people who don't, uh, don't remember it or don't, weren't there at the time, uh, what happened in 2010? So things happened. For, for my, my experience at the Tote was um, for probably the two years leading up to when we closed, uh, liquor licensing was changing the rules on us just constantly. So um, uh, I'd be called into legal licensing and told we had to put in security cameras. Um, and I'd be like, okay, they can't really afford the $20,000 for that, but I'll just have to do it. And then it was just after that, it was I thought that would be the end of it, but it was just constantly, it seemed like every month they changed the license slightly and so that we had to put on more and more security staff and uh and it was crazy because we knew how much security we needed um but the suddenly we'd have to have security two two guys standing out the front of the guys um, um standing at the front of the tote when we had an acoustic act playing on a Saturday afternoon um which meant that on the Saturday night when we might have uh uh, you know, something a bit more wild in the back room. I couldn't afford to put on the number of security I'd, I would have put on before because we're wasting our money on um, totally unneeded security. Anyway, it was all just, it just got stupid. And liquor licensing at the time just weren't, uh, they wouldn't listen to reason. Uh, I actually employed um, lawyers whose specialty was liquor licensing. Um, and they said, well, you should go and meet the head of liquor licensing and just have a chat. Uh, and I did. And it was like being called into the headmaster's office. Um, uh, she turned up late to our... I was left in a room. She walked in. The first thing the head of liquor licensing said to me was, I don't have a police report on your wife. I can, I can close you down immediately. And this is supposed to be a friendly chat. Um, when I was... <laughs> Uh, when I talked to the lawyers later, they, they went, well, that's actually not even true. Um, I don't know why she said that, but, you know, it was, it was just, it was silly. And, and she, she slapped a, um, like a phone book sized report on the table and said, this is our, um, you know, our research. Um, you're part of the alcohol fueled violence problem. And I was like, but we don't have fights and we don't have alcohol fueled violence at the tote. And she said, you're ignoring all of our research and data. And I was like, you could just call the Collingwood cops and talk to them. They could tell you they never come to the tote. Um, and she's like, she's just constantly saying, you're ignoring our research and data. And I took the, this report away. And even the report said, it, it was basically, it was a report about um, big nightclubs in, you know, in the city, huge nightclubs, you know, 5,000 capacity nightclubs where people were getting killed and, and they just lumped live music venues like the Toad in with the nightclubs. And even the, their own report said uh, the, um, I can't remember the exact wording, but basically said the, uh, whilst live music venues are included here, um, you know, there's very little uh, research to show that they are part of the alcohol fueled violence problem. And uh, anyway, it was just, it was hell. Um, and it was hell because it was, you felt like you were stuck in some weird thing where you're trying to talk simple English to people and they're just giving you some goobly goke 
ghibli gok, whatever the word is, um, and they they just didn't want to be uh, convinced by empirical evidence. They had research that showed I was part of the problem, not part of the solution. So anyway, um, I I couldn't. I got to the stage where I, the tote could not make money, um, mm. and after a number of months of losing money. Um, the, the accountant basically said, you know, you, you're a director of a business that can't make money um, and unless you can show a way that you're going to turn that around, you really have to be careful. You can't, you can't run a business when you knowingly are losing money week after week. And so I closed the tote. The tote was a very high-profile uh, victim of... I'm just having my own audio come back into my my ears. I'm going to change between seeing that. The the tote was a very high profile victim of the regulations, but the effects were much more widespread than than just than just the tote, weren't they? Absolutely, it wasn't. Uh, you know, people, uh, the tote can't take the uh, credit for um, you know what happened. Uh, venues had been closing all over Victoria um, for many months because of the changes to liquor licensing. And, and, and largely it was probably, I'm just assuming this, um, probably fueled by a government who was at the time trying to win votes leading up to election and uh, looking like they were doing something about alcohol fueled violence. That was, that was their catchphrase. Um, but the, so what had happened is that Greek restaurants that had a bazooki player had to have two guys, two, and I, again I say guys because they're always guys, had to have two people standing at the front of the restaurant, you know, being paid more than the staff who were working inside. Um, you, you had things like, uh, you know, the, uh, the hotel up uh, on Nicholson Street that had a banjo club on Sunday afternoons where people who owned banjos would come and sit around and play banjos together. Um, they had to employ two security guards out the front to stop the alcohol fueled violence. So they stopped having the banjo club. It was just ridiculous. It, and it, it was one of these situations where everyone who was involved in would just roll their eyes and go, this, this can't be going on, this can't be happening. Um, if we just talk sensibly to someone, surely they'll stop this. And in fact, the people at liquor licensing, and I'm, I still get really angry about it, the people at liquor licensing were persecuting um, great and important music venues all over town, um, and probably because the, what, the places they should have been dealing with, you know, the places where people were dying, where people were getting stabbed, where, uh, you know... Uh, where the problem they, was. They cut. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was just, it was so frustrating and so annoying. Um, and anyway, I, I just, I didn't realise that um, I was part of a, a stronger community. I was just a person who each week was losing money, um, losing sleep, <laughs> losing my hair. Um, and uh, so I closed the business down and, and thankfully everyone started to get organised just after that. Yeah. yeah, of course, just after that was the uh, Slam Rally, the Save, Save Live Australia's, Australia's Music uh, protest, which had an arguably immediate effect on uh, the, 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 the law. And um, there's, what, I mean, from a, from, a, from a person who runs a venue point of view, what were those, like, well, by the, for those who didn't know, those changes were the government basically sort of immediately reversed the... the the problem? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just... Yes, I mean, you're probably better off talking to someone who... Um, I, I was... I, I was the, the bunny or the poster boy, depending on your, uh, your outlook. Um, I was also, at the time, traumatised and bankrupt. Um, what happened was um, the government wanted to... That recognised that there was a problem, uh, and then it was a... Uh, and the people who got involved in it, the people who ran the slam rally led by um, Quincy and Helen, um, uh, then spent many months and, and years dealing with legislation and the government and sitting around tables and, and working out ways to solve um, the, the, the perceived problems. Um, and it, it wasn't a very glamorous job that they did. It, uh, it, it involved so many different departments and uh, uh, 
but slowly they put a value on live music, um, a, a value not just a financial value, but um, a, a value in all sorts of ways, uh, and then worked with government to change all of the uh, things that were unnecessarily stifling um, live music venues. Um, and uh, it, I mean, and what they've managed to achieve in the last ten years is now the, in some ways, um, every other city around the world um, looks to, or and state, I should say, looks to Victoria, looks to looks to Melbourne, and goes, what what can we do to follow their example? And uh, um, and the realization that uh, live music, people go to live music. Um, because it's uh, you know it's a community it's a community event that um, has nothing but uh, as far as I'm concerned um, a value to everyone. People don't you, you don't go and see small bands at the tote because you know you're angry and you want to start a fight with someone. You um, you go to these sort of places because you enjoy music and you enjoy hanging out with people who also enjoy music and. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know why I have to say this because it was it was so obvious. But uh, you know, the government and liquor licensing didn't get it at the time. Mm. Um, so I guess does it does looking back at how much or looking at how the scene is doing so, so well, well now, or I assume you'd say it's doing well now. Uh, do you, does it feel like in some ways, as much as it did hurt you, it was worth it in that now Melbourne does understand, understand the value of of its live music? Absolutely. Um, it's uh, it's a completely different environment we're in now um, than ten years ago, um, and I've always I mean I've always been part of a, a, a Melbourne, a Victorian, Australian music community, um, and it feels like in the last ten years uh, there's some recognition uh, of something I've known all my my life, certainly all my working life, which is I'm part of something that we should be celebrating and uh, I don't want the, the contemporary music industry to be treated like, I don't know, the opera where it's just propped up by government grants, but I do want it so that it's not being persecuted by the government, uh, which is what it was 10 years ago. And, and it's not now. They're, they're, they're constantly looking for ways to go, we know this is important. We, uh, there, is, there is a value here. People will come, tur tourists will come to... Um, Victoria to Melbourne because of the live music scene. Um, so let's get rid of some of the stupid red tape that was um, stifling it before. Is there anything that's still in place now or that's been introduced since um, some noise restriction laws that did threaten to come in come to mind? Uh, that comes to mind for you that is is an impediment to the like the live music scene, or are we faring pretty well at the moment? We're faring pretty well. I mean, if you've got a live music venue um, and there's a neighbour living next door, you have responsibilities um, to their, you know, quality of life. Um, but what happened, I mean, 10 years ago, if you bought, if you tore down a, you know, a, a warehouse next door to a pub, put up uh, 40 apartments, the first person in, who moved into one of those com apartments who co complained about the noise meant that you had to close your stop having live music. Whereas now it's changed so that the uh, if you're building next door to a live music venue, a recognised live music venue, it's your job to uh, soundproof the apartments so that people moving in there can, can get to sleep. Um, and these things seem obvious, but they're incredibly complicated because they involve, uh, you know, town planning and local councils and uh, um, the EPA and, you know, there's noise pollution and, and all sorts of things. Um, and thankfully, there are a lot of people in, in the music community who, who are willing to sit with government and councils in very long, boring meetings and work out how to make these sort of things happen. Um, so it's a very different environment now. Yeah. Going back to the Slam Valley, because that, is, of course, is later this month. That would have happened 10, 10 years ago. What was it like to see the, the community, community response, response be so strong? Like, it, it must have been, in some ways, heartening 
uh, under all that stress and all the, the grief, I guess, that was caused by it, to, to, to see up to 20,000 people turn out to support venues like, like the Tote and... and across, across Melbourne and, and, and the state. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I was still in shock by what had happened to me, but being at that rally, and it's, it wasn't up to 20,000. You can look at the aerial photos and you can basically, you can easily count 20,000 people. Um, it, it, it was uh, for all of the personal trauma, part of me was going, oh my goodness, we've actually, we've done what I hope would do all my life. We're, we're recognising the importance, the cultural importance, the financial importance, uh, in, you know, the, the artistic importance of our live music scene and we're doing something about it. Um, and that was the great thing. It was People weren't out there on the streets because they were, you know, there, there was no organised sort of, we, we, we're going to get all these people out there. It was a very ramshackled sort of, we, we're, we're pissed off and we want to, we want to demonstrate um, moment. And going to that rally, which I really thought was going to be, you know, 300 people standing outside the library walking up to Parliament and suddenly being in such a mass of people that you couldn't see, you know, where the front of the line was and where the back was, uh, was, was, was pretty incredible. Um, now that we do uh, have a chance to enjoy this wonderful live music scene, who have you seen recently that uh, has really impressed you? Who have I seen recently? Yeah, yeah, musically. Oh, I, look, for, for me, and I certainly don't go out like I, I uh, you know, until until the. Um, in, in that case, you I, are involved with Triple R. Um, which local bands have you heard that you think would be worth seeing? Well, I, I, I love, I love, I'm so I'm sixty two or sixty three. Um, I love the generational thing that goes on. So someone like. Um, uh, Chris Wilson, who uh, who played in, amongst other things, uh, Harem Scarum, a band whose um, records I released, his two sons uh, are both have bands now. So, um, you know, Fen Wilson and Polly Man uh, are sons of people that I worked with, and, uh, and and you know, sons and daughters of people. I, I love the fact that it's it's now generational that. Um, uh, I go and see bands and go, oh, my goodness, I worked with your parents. And uh, mm -hmm. um, the, that's a sign of a very strong music community where, you know, it's almost like uh, Hank Williams, Hank Williams the second, Hank Williams the third, uh, where, where you have this sort of uh, thing now where it's... Um, uh, and, and, and people like um, Beck Barnard, who's, you know, had Rebecca's Empire and, and played in so many bands, and, and now she goes out and her... Her son Harry drums in the band, and uh, um, I, I, I love that sort of uh, uh, sort of thing. I guess so. In answer to your question, uh, yes, the I, I see a lot of uh, a lot of bands, but uh, the thing that warms my heart is seeing seeing you know children of musicians um, um, playing in bands and uh, and being able to um, do things that probably their parents weren't able to do. That was about to be my next question, is that do, do, do they seem to be having an easier path into the industry than, than their parents did? Or do the, the people who aren't necessarily, uh, I mean, there's some degree of, um, I guess, it's slightly easier if your parents are or existing musicians already, but I mean, for the totally new bands and totally, musician, totally new musicians coming up, it, it, it actually is easier for them to, to come up than 10, 20, 30 years ago? Look, I th I think it is. I'm, I'm, but having said that, you've also got to recognise that um, musicians and and people in the music industry um, are, are amongst the worst paid mm. people in our community. I you know I read read reports in the paper about uh, I, I take your pick um, people working in uh, the restaurant industry and, and I and I go oh my goodness they're actually earning way more than anyone in the music industry even, even though you know people talk about them being on slave slave wages um, so yes it's look it's easier to get gigs um, but when it's easy to get gigs it just means there are more people playing music as well so in some ways um, 
it's easy, might be easy to play, um, but uh, to earn a fair living f from it is uh, is very hard. And what we need to do, I think, in in Victoria, is too much of the music industry is, and and I've been part of it, um, is based on uh, alcohol. Um, if you're a, you're in playing and you can get a lot of people along to your gig who will buy a lot of beer, you will get the gigs. Um, we need to change that model um, so that, uh, you know, the, your ability to sell beer is is not one of the main things that uh, guarantees you work in the music industry. That seems like a major change. Do you have any ideas on how, how that, that could happen? Oh, I, I, in all sorts of ways. And, and this is what... And you should talk to people who are actually involved in this, but um, uh, setting up, I mean, it became impossible, for example, at the Tote. We used to have um, all-ages gigs that then became underage gigs because the laws meant that you weren't actually allowed to have anyone who was over 18 in the room. Um, uh, and... I don't want to go through all of the ridiculous stuff, um, but those gigs became impossible to put on because we had to get there early in the morning. We had to cover every um, piece of alcohol in in, in the building, um, including advertising. You know, um, we, then we had to have more and more security. And you might get 200 kids coming to a gig on a Saturday afternoon, but they didn't want to buy water uh, you know, a 15-year-old kid uh, goes to the toilet and fills a bottle. Um, uh, so we, we couldn't possibly make money out of it. So then the people who wanted to put on those gigs would have to say to them, look, you, you have to give us $1,000 because we have to cover this, you know, security and da-da-da. And you can have 100% of the door sales. Um, and I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but that was just, it was an insane situation. Um, mm. But we need to move back to that, making it so that when I grew up, Gigs would be at church halls and town halls. So I'd go to, uh, you know, the My Music Bowl, universities, Melbourne Town Hall, um, you know, surf lifesaving clubs along along the coast. That's where gigs were, which meant that I, I, I was going to gigs regularly from when I was 13 and 14 years old because there was just so much happening and it was, and it was very exciting. Um we need to move it so the gigs don't have to always be at um, places that serve alcohol. Um, so uh, finding ways to encourage councils and to utilise space um, to move some ways back to the sort of situation back in the 60s and early 70s where, you know, big town halls were places where the local community could go and uh, have some entertainment. Um, you know, you look at you go drive past a big town hall. It's in theory, it's owned by the the people who live there, um, and it should be used. Um, uh, and and that this sort of thing is going on. So I'm, I'm uh, um, sounds like I'm just raving off the top of my head, but I, it, it there there are moves towards this all the time. Now, you, speaking, speaking of entertainment uh, and people finding entertainment, you're a host on Triple R F M. Where can people hear or catch your show? And when? <laughs> uh, uh, well, these days, I mean, you can turn on the radio on Sunday nights, but, uh, of course, Triple R, like most radio stations, uh, archives every show, um, and so you can just go to a website and uh, click on or click off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, your, your record store, where can people find you? Uh, we're in Greville Street in Paran, um, uh, where we've been for 40, 41 years now. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in, in the south of Melbourne. Very cool. Bruce, thank you so much for joining us and for suffering through about 30 minutes of technical difficulties before the stream could start. Thank you. No, no worries. Okay, thank you, Bruce, so much again for, for joining us. Um, now, while we are talking live music, and you're just going to excuse me as I look to the screen to my left, um, uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple of uh, things that I'm planning on going to uh, <laughs> coming up this week. Uh, if we switch over to uh, second monitor here, uh, Forever Renter has a new um, single out. Uh, pins, well, it's, it's a single that was on the recent EP. 
they're launching that at Grace Darling Hotel um, on Valentine's Day, the 14th of Feb. Uh, they do have a new video clip for that as well, which uh, I'll just play a fraction of here. Gorgeously shot. They, they filmed it recently. Um, well worth checking out musically and, and visually. And uh, Jasmine Rose, um, at Blood Jasmine on uh, Instagram, is a musician from, uh, well, formerly from Vic, now in New Zealand, but is back in Melbourne performing um, uh, a fundraising gig. Uh, just trying to figure out where that's happening. I think there'll be a post later in the, in the week. But uh, that's... That's all for, for, for today's episode uh, This uh, on Sunday, the 9th of Feb 2020. I'm Will Coolidge. Thanks so much for watching.